growing up in post-war Korea in the 50s and 60s. Choi Kang Kyun Shin is an author and Fulbright, Fulbright scholar who has been a teacher, an educator, and writer, and she lives in Framingham. So thank you to Shin for sharing your story with us tonight, and please enjoy. We, we uh, did a lot of this together, but she's the writer and I'm just. So I, what, I, what I wanted to do was put context around what's going on because everybody knows something about Korea. Uh, everybody knows a lot about what really happened before the war, leading up to the war, leading up to the time where, where Shin grew up in post-war Korea. So I thought I'd take a few minutes just to give you uh, an update on what happened before the war. So. For those of you who don't know, and I think everybody might know, that Korea is here and strategically very important in Asia Pacific area because it's contiguous to Russia, China, Japan, and the entrance to the South China Sea. And down here, this is called the Straits of Malacca, outside Indonesia. 40% of all the world's freight cargo goes through the Straits of Malacca. So this is strategically very important. And when you see that the Chinese are building these islands out here, uh, they're controlling the entrance to the Straits of Malacca. That's why it's such a big deal. But anyway, so just for the geopolitical location. So as a timeline for what happened and when it happened, in 1904 there was a Russo-Japanese war, which the Japanese won, and they were fighting over the northern section of Manchuria, and China, Vladivostok, and the area of, of northern Korea. And, and the Chinese won, and as a result, the Chinese forced the Soviets back, and then they took full control of not only the Korean Peninsula, but most of China. And, and uh, they, they forced China, Korea to sign a protectorate. The United States was not in the picture. We weren't involved. We were strictly, you know, Fortress America at that time. Sounds familiar, you know. And then they fully annexed Korea in 1910 to 1945. Now this was a very difficult time for Korea because during the time of the full Japanese occupation, the China, Japan literally tried to rewrite Korean history such that China, Japan had always controlled China, that Korea had always been a protectorate or a colony or whatever and so that, that uh, not unlike what Hitler did in Europe saying we only want Poland, you know, the Japanese moved into Korea as a stepping stone into China, so by taking full control. And, and uh, during the, the World War I, Japan just continued to bring more and more military into the location. And up until 95, uh, 1945, Japan was in full control. So what did that mean for Koreans? Well, it meant that Koreans were forced to a Japan, have Japanese names. They were completely rewrote history. They had, they could not speak Korean, they were forced to speak Japanese, and, and they were forced to pay allegiance to the emperor, and even they took uh, the Korean royal family and married some of the Korean royal family into the Japanese royal family to say that Korea had always been, you know, a part, and so they really annexed not only the geography of the country, but they tried to hijack the culture uh, of Korea, so that's very important. At the end of the war, the Soviets and the United States and China and Korea were saying, well, what do we do? How do we divide up this land? And there's, there's a very interesting story to how the 38th parallel came to be as a part of Korean history. Now, there's a name that you may know, Dean Rusk. He, he went on to be Secretary of State uh, much later. But Dean Rusk was a lonely colonel, you know, in the Army at that time. <laughs> and he also was a colonel with another colonel, Harry Bonesteel otherwise known as Tick Bone Steel. And on the evening of August 13th, 1945, George Marshall was the chief of the army at that time, chief of staff, and he said, we have to find a way to divide Korea, north and south. Well, neither Rush nor Bone Steel had any experience in Korea, had never been really uh, up on Asian history, knew nothing about it, and so they had to spend the evening trying to figure out how to divide north and south Korea. And, and uh, they came out in the morning and they said, well, they, they pulled out a map of the Korean Peninsula and they saw that uh, the 38th parallel kind of evenly bisected the peninsula. And they also thought they wanted to make sure that Seoul was in South Korea and also uh, where the, most of the army of occupation was at that time was below Seoul. So two inexperienced colonels, you know, 
went overnight, read all the books they could, got out the National Geographic map, and they came up and said, okay, 38th parallel, that sounds good. And they went in the next morning and proposed it to the Soviet and the Japanese and the Chinese, and, were, and they, they accepted it right away, no question. Well, it turned out that there was a reason why they accepted it without, and, and neither Rust nor Bone Steel nor anybody currently at that treaty signing knew, was that after the Russo-Japanese War, the Russians and the Japanese had decided that Korea at Sunday would be divided and the 38th parallel would be the dividing line between the sphere of Soviet influence and the sphere of Japanese influence. But nobody who was present at that division of North and South Korea knew that. And they, they predicted, they, they analyzed and said one of the reasons we ha they had such a problem with North and South Korea is because the Soviets thought that we had recognized their sphere of influence by drawing the 38th parallel where it had already been drawn you know, 40 years earlier. So kind of quirk of history of how things go. So in 1950, uh, the North Korean army crossed the, the 38th parallel. May 1951, Seoul was retaken by the 8th Army because of MacArthur's invasion in Incheon. Let me show you how that looks on a picture. So again, North, South Korea, 38th parallel. Very straight division, just happened to be right through. And then in terms of when, the North, when North Korea crossed the dividing line here, they crossed over very quickly. They caught South Korea, United States completely by surprise. Nobody predicted that there was gonna be any crossing over. And, and uh, the United States also had not given Korea any weapons. And in fact, right after World War II, the United States Army had virtually demobilized and virtually had no weapons available in the Asian theater and therefore didn't help the, the Chinese, didn't help the Koreans, didn't help anybody much in that part of the world because we were so focused on the European theater. So you can see here, th these red arrows were, the, were the, the North Koreans. So North Koreans crossed the 38th parallel and actually drove all of Korea down into this very small corner here. Now this, this city down here, Daegu is very important as, as Shin will show later because her family was forced to flee from South Korea as the army pushed south into the safe area, the northernmost tip was Daegu. So her, her family migrated, were actually refugees from Seoul to there and they spent, Shin spent most of her young life in this area because of that's where it came out. When, when MacArthur came back at Incheon later, the famous Incheon landing, what he did was he came around here and cut off the North Koreans and came up behind the forces and it quickly ended the war. So in 1951, the, actually the war, the fighting war was practically over, but it took two more years to negotiate the peace. And it finally settled roughly, you know, on the 30th parallel, but it's not a straight line anymore because when the Americans and the North Koreans negotiated that part of the war, the, the Americans tried to take the high ground to have a defensible border and not just a 38th parallel border. So that's why it's no longer a straight line. They still refer to it as a 38th parallel, but it's not. That's just a historic term that has no meaning anymore. So uh, MacArthur's Landing, uh, you know, everybody knows that picture. You've seen that picture probably before. So currently, at that time, just after the war, Kim Il-sung was the, the president, leader, chairman of North Korea, installed by the Soviets. But also, Kim Il-sung had an interesting history. He was actually a war hero you know, uh, during the Japanese occupation and really organized most of the defense against the Japanese occupation and was led a guerrilla force and then also was aided by the Chinese. So he has a legitimate claim to leadership because of the work that he did during that 1910 to 1945 period. So heavily influenced by the Soviets. Sing Mun Ri, Ri Sing Mun, was actually living in the United States just during that whole period of time. It was in, installed by the United States as the dictator. In fact, there was some question as to actually how much Korean he spoke. Uh, and he had lived in the United States for such a long time that he was more American and Korea. So we installed, the I say we, the United States installed him as the first leader of South Korea. So in terms of legitimacy of who should be president of North Korea and who should be president of South Korea, that, you know, it, it was really a question at that time. And now we get to the good stuff. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
this is why she's here. <laughs> this is uh, Shin's father and mother at their wedding, which what, is in 1940. 1920. They never talked about it. They never talked about it. 1940 is probably during that period of time, during the Japanese occupation. And then this is the book derives its title, A Doll for a Day, from this picture, the doll that was sent, and she'll have heard about that, and, and guess who this is? <laughs> <laughs> and she had a death grip on the doll. She was not going to let that go. <laughs> so that being said, that kind of puts it all in context, the, uh, and, and I have the honor of introducing my wife, Jay Kim Shen. Sit down first? Yeah, sit down first. Okay. <coughs> to give you some more background, when the Korean War began, I think it's July of 1945, so we have to turn the mic back. You have to turn on oh, the mic. Oh, turn it on? Yes. Here. Is it recording? The, it's recording. Okay. What do I have to do? <coughs> anyway, so I was a uh, bestie. So I, <coughs> from Seoul to, Seoul to Daegu, that was uh, today's, the, today's um, modern transportation, it would take uh, three hours, but at the time, I guess, the eight hours from the train, slow train. Anyway, so that's where I spend most of the time. Very important aspect of my upbringing <coughs> is that at that time, at the time, 50s and 50s particularly, when I was, uh, um, Korea was, uh, South Korea was uh, poorer than North Korea. So uh, after, after the war, everything was just a scarcity of food. There's uh, nothing there. I only I did not know as a child how poor I was. And uh, so th this story is uh, writing a memoir, so to speak. I had a two, it, it, it's sort of a, I felt very vulnerable writing this, but I felt I had to write because one of the things is that my children have uh, no clue where I was born, where I came from. They just uh, suddenly, boom, and I'm just uh, their, their parents. So I was really upset at their attitude. <laughs> so I have to write this, and you're going to read this. <laughs> that was my intention. I just wrote it for my two children, two children. So trying to explain, you know, when I was growing up, I, I just felt it too funny to say this. So I've been writing on and off, but just put it together. So this is a story about the time, you know, Flooding as a as a, as a literary refugee from Seoul to my hometown Seoul to Daegu, and then um, up until I came to America. So as a really immigrant to the United States, and I never really talked about what was life was like to my children, so that the sort of a emotionally vulnerable. <laughs> And but I had to write because I've been already writing here, there, everywhere. And uh, here I must recognize it to, to you. Here's the Wendy and Bruce and the dear, dear friend. It just the, I've known her over how many years? Fifth. Oh, no, my goodness, decades. <laughs> Since 1975. Right. Yes. <laughs> here I had no clue. She just came, and I was thinking. I was like watching movies. <laughs> I said, this is Wendy and Vivi and, and dear friend. This I'm, I'm really amazing. Anyway, I'm going to read the two stories uh, from my book. And as I said, uh, why I wrote this book and the writing memoir, <coughs> I often ask myself, who do you think I am? <laughs> and why am I writing? And after that, what is, what is this for? And I kept asking myself about it, but again, the major 
major objectives I want my children to know because all the things were not the same, at least. So that was the only way I know how to tell the story. So it was a f bit of a funny, but without further ado, <coughs> again, 1950s were just things were just left and right, scarce, food may mainly. So um, very first story is about, I call the uh, very first cup of milk I, I tasted. So, um, a uh, cup of milk taste, cup of milk, that's a story. Uh, <coughs> so let, here it goes. Tip, typic, <coughs> typical Korean meals when I was growing up consist of a large portion of a steamed white rice and assorted side dishes made from vegetable. Rice and veg vegetable dishes were the mainstay of our table, if you could afford them. My favorite banchans, which is side dishes, include black beans in soy sauce and honey, fried uh, bean curd slices, and a bean paste stew called jjigae. <coughs> as, as most Koreans, I did, as most, I, as most Koreans did at that time, ate the same food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Perhaps the side dishes, side dish might be different, but most of the time it was the same food for every meal. Consequently, malnutrition was malnutrition was uh, common among the school children. Most Koreans got protein through the bean-related product, tofu, bean paste, bean sprout dishes. Only on our birthday meals or holiday feast did we have a chance to eat some meat. Eating egg was a, a considered something special. My father and brother got to eat the fried eggs more often than I did, even though I was fond of eggs. The US Army, US 8th Army Division stationed in Daegu previously donate, generously donated powdered milk to local primary school. Up until that time, I never knew about milk, as no Koreans at that time included milk in our daily uh, diet. That all changed with the donated powdered milk when one day my third grade teacher, Miss O, told us that we had to drink a cup of milk to be strong. During the morning school break, along with uh, my classmate, we lined up in the school kitchen area to get our cup of milk. My first cup of con deconstituted milk tasted awful. The result was that I got diarrhea, and so did my sisters, who also drank a cup of milk. Whether we liked it or not, all school children were required to drink the mandatory protein drink from then on. Tasting a cup of lukewarm, insipid milk from a tub of a U.S. surplus powdered milk was, to say the least, traumatic. Neither sweet nor salty, the milk was tasteless by Korean standard. I tried to avoid the weekly uh, ritual whenever I could, but without success since under my teacher's watchful eyes. I could not help but think the taste is milk. Miss O told us that all American children were strong because they drank milk, although I had a hard time believing this story. The cup of milk, which was scooped out of a big pot in the school kitchen, was one of the most dreadful experiences of my, my school memories. On the other hand, I felt sorry for American children who had to drink this stuff all the time. On top of that required drink, our, the school distributed five pounds of powdered milk to take home for each family. First, we were delighted to get, um, get some surprising gift from school. Then w I learned that my mother did not know what to do with it. She ended up uh, stewing, steaming the powdered milk by placing it in a shallow dish with a heaping powdered milk on top of the rice pot. Mother often made 
most side dishes this way by steaming them. But the result in this case was not exactly what we had ex expected. It looked like a small square cake, but so hard that we could not even sink our teeth into, into it or cut it into small pieces. Disappointed, we had to throw the whole milk cake away. All Korean rice cakes were made this exact same way by steaming the layers of rice flour and other grain like a bean, red beans or mung beans. We learned the hard way that apparently American powder milk worked differently from our rice flour, even though they looked similar. In the following school years, I was glad to find out that mandatory school drink, milk drinking was not required. That experience was the last time that I saw and tasted any milk, let alone dry powdered milk in any kind. I was most relieved. <laughs> the next story is, um, as in, in this picture, I have another younger sister, but the, uh, at that time, I guess I was, I was five years old and the, my brother's two years younger, two years older, and she's the older sister, and this is my mother. And the, the title is A Doll for the Day. <coughs> Growing up in the 50s after, after the Korean War, I had none of the typical things that American children might have, such as a doll or train set or anything consi considered a manufactured toy for children. Instead, I played with the bean pouches my mother made. Sometimes I made a paper, paper uh, bird or, draw, or drew, drew one on paper and uh, played with it. No one uh, com complained about such condition since we did not know any other way. Material things were very scarce. and a gift was a so foreign. How strange it is when I think about those times that I never received a single gift. On my birthday, I might have one of my favorite soups or side dishes or special rice cake, but that was all. That's just the way it was. But it all changed one day when I got a gift from an aunt. Actually, the gift was for all three sisters. I was five years old. Excuse me. It was one of the first and the most memorable gift. When my two sisters and I opened the box, when I opened the box revealing the doll, I could not help thinking that she was almost like a real person. She, I've never seen a doll like this before. She had a blonde curly hair and blue eyes. The doll wore a fancy, fancy lacy white and pink dress. What was the most striking was that she had a, a pair of black patent leather shoes with a white lace trimmed nylon socks. She was a rather large and pretty and well-dressed doll who looked almost alive. The doll's braided yellow hair was uh, mesmerizing. And so we were, so, so were her shiny and icy blue eyes with long eyelashes. We all thought that th the doll was uh, exceptionally pretty I never know. I I have never known any Korean child who played with such a doll until then. My two older sisters loved the doll as much as I did, although some might have thought we were too old to play with dolls. I guess that <coughs> I played the most with the doll since since the doll since the day she arrived. Actually, I most just stared at her stared at her plump legs and arms. Occasionally, I set the doll up and then would put her down to see whether she would shut her eyes again. The doll always did, no matter how many times I repeated. 
She was a surprising, surprising guest from a far, far away country, and we became amazing friends in such a short time. I thought it would take, I would take care of her forever. <coughs> then, with three sisters, both to play with the door. The next day, mother asked me to accompany her to a marketplace and my brother was also invited too. Before we got to the market, mother took us to a photo shop. Traditionally, my family went to take a photo during a major holidays, but it was not a holiday on this day. This time, we were taking a photo with a newly arrived present, and I hung on, hung on tightly on it. Excuse me. After taking the photo, we went to the market. As I was the youngest girl, I proudly carried the doll in my left hand. <coughs> I could tell that many people in the market were noticing my doll. Passerby turned and looked back at it. I let my older sister carry the doll only when I was tired of carrying it, and they would beam. They would and they would beam with pride. Mother took us took us into a store. The shop owner took a store to see the doll and I let, oh, the shop owner wanted to see the doll and I let her. My mother and the store owner talked for a long time and finally my mother nodded to her. Then mother said, I had to leave the door at the store I asked mother, do I have to? Mother said, yes, you do. And I did not want to leave the door at the store. Mother promised me to, mother promised to, she would buy us a better door. As we were leaving the door, we all cried. The doll with the yellow hair just stared at us without crying. We all cried all the way home. After I became much older, I asked my mother about the door. Mother told me that she exchanged the door for money so that we could buy something more practical. American goods were valuable in high demand after the Korean War. Mother said that I had become, I had become too old anyway to play with, uh, with a door. <coughs> mother was right in her judgment, but my sisters and I were still heartbroken at that time. I only had a door just for one day. Thank you. Thank you. So that's the story. <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny to remember things, how everything is evolved around not having enough. Just eating was a, Eating itself was a problem. And also, <coughs> growing up as a girl, education was not always available for a girl. It's a limited resources, it goes to the boy. So I was keenly aware <laughs> as I was growing up that I would not get to school. Anything beyond the primary school, you have to, thank you. You have to pay school tuition. My family couldn't afford to, so that we have, a, I have a three, three sisters and one boy. So the boy can get to school, but the rest are up to your own way, your own whatever it means. So anyway, uh, this type of struggling story was a, you know, at this point in my life, it was kind of interesting because after all, I survived it. But uh, my children were at times they were complaining. I was thinking, you know, I keep hearing this story about old story that well, when you, when snow without the shoes <laughs> going up and down story. But I, I was thinking, oh, you really do not know what it's like, but can you eat or not? Because my father was out of a job for such a long time. We, we had a house and moving to smaller, smaller place. And we haven't, I had no idea whether we could eat or not. But but that's the way it was. So growing up, figuring out, but gee, I did not know. I did not know Korea was that poor, poorer than during 50s. 
North Korea did not have the same problem because they had the aid by the uh, Soviet. <coughs> but South Korea has a problem. So everybody's scared. And the just just remembering things and then tell telling that story to my children, I was felt like little, you know, out of context and felt the funny about it. So I ended up writing and I said, I want you to read. <laughs> So that's how it happened. And Can yes. you tell us about how you and your sister lived alone for a long time when you were young? <coughs> so Wendy knows something. <coughs> so and so primary compulsory school system is the six years. So after that, after that, um, because we came from Seoul, most people went to back to Seoul, but my family did not, so I lived in, in that southern part of it. So the, you know, the people knew right away you are from the, from the capital, so because <coughs> they have a Seoul accent. So I was always knew that was different. <coughs> I lived, so we ended up, we ex my family exhausted the means. So the only way is going back to where we came from, so they left. But I decided not to go because I was attending a school which was a rather prestigious school, um, if you may, in, in Asian school system, they have this system, it's very clear who goes to the best school based on the things. I happened to went to the one of the best school. So uh, that was age 14. I decided I'm, I'm not going to, going to be the family because I know going back to Seoul, there's nothing there. I mean, that's my parents have religion, I don't. So I ended up, uh, my, myself and my sister had one more year to finish middle school. And then my old, older sister has a one more year. So she and I lived <laughs> two together. But in, can you imagine, at that time, there's a living situation is such that you have to make a fire every morning to, to cook. When we go to school, when you come back, there's fires gone. You have to start it again. Cooked rice every time. It was a horrible. We, we were not good at housekeeping at all. It, it just, but, but so I, I managed to spend the whole year. And I did it well. I did it well in, I guess, school, the school record was. So I finished the middle school that way. So it's a time to go back to join the family. Somehow I decided not to join my family. Because I felt like if I go there, there's nothing waiting for me. So I ended up staying by myself, finished the senior high school, and then went to college. And then the moment I came, to, then I came to America. It was sort of a, I know it's a very sort of a rough snapshot, but that's how I came here. So when I'm here, just that. Um, so one of the key things that I had to pay tuition. That was a, that was a, such a struggle, tuition. The only way to pay tuition is that. You have to get a scholarship. Scholarship goes to the first in the student. In, in high school or middle school, middle school because I went to the best middle school, uh, 60 students. But in high school, there are 80 students in class. You have to be the best in, in the class. And you never know whether you are best or not after the semester is over. Anyway, but you have to be. So that that's the only way that I can stay to get scholarship. And eating, oh, I, I, I cannot, you, you finish the story. It's a little too, too <laughs> I'm sorry, too emotionally.
So my children would say, Mom, you are always so tight. And I was thinking, was I? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they thought they were, I'm not neither like his other friends. I'm, I don't, you know, easygoing and enjoy things. You are always uptight. And I, I thought about that. I was, because of course you don't know you are always uptight <laughs> when, when you, your whole life was like that. Then I, 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 I realized, yes, I was, and I, I was you know, reflecting my life. Why was I so uptight? Because my life was always uptight. If I don't make it, I, I'm just, uh, you know, my, my three sisters graduated high school. They all married, and that's the way it is. I'm the only one, first generation, going to college and then coming to America. Then again, life was the same way. And, but it was really strange to talk about that aspect of children. It went, uh, my kids would want you to be, you know, really fun loving and like this. I don't know, I don't know who they had modeled after. <laughs> I, I, I was really upset. I said, let me tell you. But, but you cannot do that because they don't know. They don't know what it's like to have a parents they have their own life. So anyway, so that it was a very, very therapeutic. At the same time, I was angry at my children. So you do not know what the life is like. You went to the school and you don't have to worry about tuition and what it'd be like, whether you can stay on school or not. You, have, you don't have a thing. Anyway, <laughs> that, that's how it came. And the, again, um, the fast forward, so I came to America after, and the, um, that was not a, a still struggling, because I'm basically immigrant, and, and the, although I, I thought I was a hot shot, but you started out to, from scratch, and in a graduate school I was in, the, doesn't speak a thing, and, and it was just horrible. <laughs> the work, all, all my life I worked, but always a struggle. My children were right, I was never always uptight, not didn't smile much and not fun-loving at all because to me, fun-loving is uh, doing things what you set up to do. <laughs> you know, then you have uh, things you do. And I finished that, I'm glad I, I smile at myself and not with the children, so. So, so that's uh, my sort of a <laughs> shitty <laughs> story, but I was, uh, I wrote it. And I don't think my children, Evan and Nora, did not read. At least I did ask, she said, oh, mom, I'm so busy, as if I do not know what that means. <laughs> so I said, okay, I wrote it, I gave it to you, it's up to you, I'm, like, I did my job. So that was it, that's the story. Thank you so much for listening. It, it, it means a lot to me, it, it almost like, <sighs> my children are not listening, but I felt like you should be here <laughs> listening. <laughs> Anyway, um, here I am. Yes, any questions I can? Yeah. Okay, what did I study? So, my parents had the idea that what I should be. She said, uh, uh, my, both my mother, you should be a doctor, medical doctor. <laughs> is, it, is it familiar to you? <laughs> I'm so glad. Why? Because I was good at math, and somebody has to be a doctor. Then I get married to a doctor, and then bring the uh, honor. And so I, I calculated what it takes to be a doctor. I said, no. Then I married another doctor. Who am I? I'm going to be housewife. <laughs> That's not a good deal. So I said, no. I studied English Lit, because <laughs> that was a useful thing to do. But all, at the same time, so I managed to finish the college on scholarship, and I did it well, but I was also busy tutoring and uh, making money. So I was not a really good student as much as I should be, but I was a class president. I did it all, whatever, and on the working full-time, tutoring and you know, making money. So I came here as a being uh, English lit, a major, 
America is the place, Nathaniel Hawthorne, I have to see them, <laughs> Emerson, <laughs> and I have to be here. So it was a natural progression. I want to be in the United States, read and visit, visit places. So I came here. Um, at, um, again, uh, my idea was going to graduate school, study PhD, and have uh, more educators, but that was uh, my taste. My parents were really upset because I didn't become a medical doctor. Furthermore, I introduced him, <laughs> and that was like, how could you? <laughs> yeah. My, my parents were first because, were you pregnant? And no, we didn't even hold a hand. <laughs> Anyway, I, I, I came here to, in Vermont to teach at the uh, SIT and the Fort Peace School training. That's how I came. Then I stayed and uh, married. And then I came here and uh, studied. Uh, <coughs> I studied initially library and information science. And uh, that was a good entry to, I wanted the world of uh, education matter to me, knowledge so that if I not, I can always know how to go about it. Then I studied other things like MBA. And then eventually one of the things, the proudest moment maybe, I eventually, um, four years ago, 2016, I was awarded a Fulbright Scholar. So I went to China and I taught in graduate school. And that was a highlight. And, and then I told my two sisters that they are they are all dead, but I, I became Fulbright Scholar. They said, uh, oh, <laughs> they don't know what it meant because <laughs> they are not in education. So that was that. <laughs> so that's what I did. Uh, anyway, um, I, I felt like my life was I did everything backward, so to speak, because there was no, the path laid out for me was not the one I chose. Therefore, I have to figure it out. So it was really interesting you said uh, they want you to be a medical doctor and marry another medical doctor. And I say, it doesn't work that way, but you know. <laughs> So how did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's a it's a rather familiar story. <laughs> Have you written your memoir yet? Is she from Korea? Yes. Oh, really? Okay, so she. She's in Vietnam. Okay, so she would relate more that the, yeah, poverty or eating was a. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, still struggling. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing. I am struggling. I mean, that's my middle name. I mean, if you do well, you struggle. If you don't do well, you struggle. And the, you know, jealousy and, and all those things. And, you know, came back from the full rest scholar. That was uh, my ultimate, a uh, glorious moment. Came back and taught in, in graduate school in, in China. I came back. You know, and my local, uh, my employer, that doesn't make any difference. And I just kind of quietly, and I was <laughs> depressed for three months. <laughs> because it, it, you want to share your, your experience, but there's really nothing happened. So I ended up writing a book, mm -hmm. and <laughs> writing a book about that experience. Mm -hmm. then, then, yeah, it's... Mm -hmm. hmm? Thank you, thank you. Um, 
often um, I share with you some, sometimes people say, you are ambitious, uh, ambitious, you know. Uh, or sometimes I like to say things are driven, and something compels you to, you want to do things, you want to write. I mean, I still struggle with, with it in the English too, in, in the pronunciation. The moment I open my mouth, they know that I'm not a native uh, speaker. Um, does it matter? Um, in a in a long run, it is not. But I wish I can kind of uh, cover it up so that people do not say they could, they always then predictably ask, "Where are you from?" Or things. Oh my God, I'm as if I'm in my twenties. <laughs> but <laughs> you know what I mean. But um, I'm mature enough. I'm very, I'm I'm seventy years old, and uh, quite still you know active in many things. But um, I guess. I guess that I, I guess my deep secret, perhaps, is that I wish my children have a. Well, it's not that them. It's I wish I had the capacity when I was when they were young, tell you more, include them into my life or what 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 drove me to do what I do. They all they see was uh, she was always uh, busy. But. They don't know why I was busy, what, what I had to do. So that was a little bit of regret on my part. Because my children, actually, one of my son, I have a boy and girl, they went to Korea without without telling, because I did not know they, they went there. Then they came back and said, you know, Korean women were very smiling, and they were very free spirit. My son was like surprised how, well, that's because it's 2018. <laughs> Life is so different and so affluent, different. Plus, because your perspective is different, and your tourists, so you tend to meet other tourists, or of course they are, they are happy to see you, but they were meaning they were not like you, mom. <laughs> so I'm glad that you found that, but I. I was shocked that this, you know, Korean women were really very fun-loving and smiling and, and not like, again, <laughs> that was a discovery. Even though they didn't remember that. Yeah. That's right. I remember when you were telling the story about your living alone, you were talking about not having any food in the house at all and needing to go and find it a lot. Yeah, so yeah. Nothing, really there nothing. Was. Not only nothing means a. And no prospect of getting anything. Yeah, that. yeah. There's no no social security system. There's no soup kitchen. There's a no place. It, it it. I cannot say things without crying. <laughs> Feeling hungry, what it means? They have no clue. No clue. You know, it, it, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> no clue, you know, anyway, anyway, so but nevertheless. I could share a funny story. I yeah. think it's a funny story. No, I may sit down now. The, the, um, <laughs> when the Peace Corps actually left Korea in 1985, there was, there was no longer any leader by Peace Corps because the leader was getting well by the government and whatever. And, and so, Several of us were invited back around 2007, 2008. Um, the Korean government recognized the service that Peace Corps Volunteer had done, and so there was a group of us who went back to be recognized. And at that time, actually, someone who was a former Peace Corps Volunteer was actually installed as a new U.S. ambassador to Korea, Captain Stevens. He was still in the Boston area at that time. And so we were invited to her inauguration. So we were, we were treated and feted and all that. And Reestablished sometime in the 90s what they call a Korean folk village, Korean folk town. And it's kind of like Sherwood Village or Sherwood Plantation because Korea is so young. And people are so young, they don't have a government. Like when I was up yeah. there, most of them born after 1980. And so 
So, so as, as part of our tour sponsoring Jane Durbin, we were taken back to show us the tour from Lincoln Park Center. And, and uh, so we were led by a young Korean tour guide who was a very young uh, woman. And she was taking us around different parts of the village to demonstrate different sections, different provinces. I had lived in the central province of Korea. And, and each province really has a distinct accent, distinct food, and distinct food. And, and they, they went to this one section. They said, well, this is a, a, an example of a house from Gyeongsangbuk-do, which is the central province. And this is Southeast Asia. So she said, have you ever seen this before? I said, seen it? I lived in Seoul. <laughs> she looked at me with this strange face. Like, what, you lived in this house? I said, no. I lived in Korea at a time when this was was the house, and, and, and actually, I lived in a better house than Kim Jong Un. You know, a, as an example, <coughs> when I visited in the Midwest, there was a section for a uh, slave house, and I visited, and I, I was looking at this is slave house. That house was bigger than the house I lived with the family of seven, because at least slave house has a a section and then two bedroom. So the older boys, and the girls live in one, and my father and my brother will learn. It would just be when you don't have any means, and you don't have, you know, my father didn't have a job for a long time. At that time, not, not just my father, many people did not have a job that 50s and the early 60s. Uh, it's a horrible, horrible kind of electricity, water, you know, it, it, when it comes, oh, there's electricity. Water, your weight, you know, put the uh, thing. Uh, it, that kind of things, living in, it was, I, I, it, so I, I always said that material things, plentifulness, I appreciate it. In, 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 in this day, if, I, if he wastes something, I get very upset. If, if we, uh, the shaving, you know, the shower running, I said, you're wasting water, <laughs> hot water. He, it still bothers me that, you know, water, what it's like, like not having, you know, water is just rationed, and you get it, and you know, wait until 12 or 1 a.m. to get uh, the water. But hot water wasting, I, I still react very strongly. <laughs> no wonder my son says, my mother never smiles. <laughs> Always uptight. <laughs> it was interesting. Uh, somebody actually mentioned that the that doll that I had only one day, the big doll, and somebody said, uh, "Well, I may able to find one because it was um, since I the time uh, since I have the picture, and I thought." What would it be like to find that doll again? <laughs> yeah. I, it was such an emotionally, it was just a one day. Because probably, yeah, it would be actually a good thing if I had more than one. I would be too attached to, you know what I mean? But yeah, so. Here's another one. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for coming and thank you for sharing your story. And the, uh, so I'm done, or do I have to turn it off, or what do I have? To I know 8.30 is the one day close here, I believe. Okay. Yeah, no. but so the. For those of you who haven't yet, I'm, I'm the market worker. <laughs> 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 At the price of $10, you can come and uh, thank you. of Shin's age. Thank you, and thank you so much.
visit and met my children. She never smiles as they walk us through the room. So I went the rare moment I went to Korea. I spent over one week, two weeks in Nixon. But when I but when I sat by my mother, I had a note first. Whatever she said, I wrote it down and it's sort of like below the newspaper journalist mm -hmm. notebook. I wrote it. It it was very difficult to crack it, but it's there. That's not she's not used to her life or talking about it. And she was she wants she's still looking for it, you know. She yeah, really yeah. doesn't want to. Oh, I I can feel it. I I know because it was always the I was not always able to even talk about it. That is. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Jesse. <laughs> on the West Coast, and likelihood of their coming here is so far not very hopeful <laughs> that I'm okay. All right. I mean, I left 8,000 miles without thinking how my parents may have felt. But they were, I, they were, now I understand how much they were counting on me. They were going to the doctors, whatever, their dreams. Unbelievably, it's a pretty nice that's kind of what my day did all in mm -hmm. ten years. So I think it's a story of generations, you know. Yeah, really yeah, do. yeah. But the uh, I was mad at my children. That was right. <laughs> mad at children and mad. That's it. Well, they wouldn't have described you quite as a tiger mom, but close. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> they are not using, but they know it's a, you know, you are you are just a essentially the Chinese Depression. You know, 30 million people died of starvation, et cetera, et cetera. So these kids, you know, they study. <laughs> mm -hmm. They study hard. You know, and, and when they come... The, studies that they, they, during summertime, all the teaching is there in the summer, they study here, then they go back and study again so that to get ahead. But how hard they study. Mm -hmm. you know, and then the U.S., Paris, campus, you, you, don't, you don't feel it. I mean, that again, as a young, young self at the time, I was studying hard because that's the only way out. Otherwise, either you are, like my sister said, she was not married, not, I don't know how. The one thing I want to tell you, as I'm looking, this is the only few pictures I have as an immigrant, I don't know how to do. So we're just looking at, Sweater. My mother made it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Yeah. Isn't beautiful. it beautiful? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially the one I have. I always have the yeah. fancy suit. Look at the design. <laughs> 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 and I thought that was so nice. Mm -hmm. You know, all these designs. I just just thought it was also glorious. Uh, Lena Sachs, she did it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Okay, fine. We have to, they're going to kick us out. Yeah. <laughs>